Today is April uh, the 3rd, 2020, and our house, like almost every house I think in the world, is in lockdown because of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the first two or three weeks were quite useful for doing all those little jobs that I said I would do when there was time. Well, there has been time, so I think most of those little jobs have now been done. I'm also experimenting with growing some whiskers here. How long they'll last, I do not know. But I'm aware that this will not be over just in a day or two. And so I want to make the most of the time. So I've decided to... Um, to do some online teaching just in the house and put it on the website in the prayer and the hope that it will be of useful to some people. I've entitled this talk today, The Abuse of Grace. The Abuse of Grace. Where will I start? Well, in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 to 27, the Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Well, truth be told, I have hesitated quite a few times about bringing this particular stream of truth to the open table. But, you know, it's too serious to lie hidden any longer. But before we look at the abuse of grace, let's understand what God's grace is and what it is meant to achieve. If we are truly followers of Jesus Christ, then we are truly beneficiaries of God's amazing grace. I was a church attender for many years throughout my 30s, thinking that by faithfully attending church every Sunday and taking communion and even hosting a fortnightly home group in our house, that I was a Christian. Well, as I reflect, I realise that I was someone who certainly gave, well, quite a bit of intellectual assent to God and to the work of Jesus on the cross. But I was definitely not a born-again, spirit-awakened child of God. In truth, I was still the Lord and Master of my own life. Uh, then on August the 12th, 1989, God's amazing grace suddenly opened the eyes of my heart and Oh, I dashed to the front of a tent meeting and there on bended knees, I fully and I joyfully surrendered my whole life to Jesus. From that point on, he had my heart and not just my mind. All of grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, we all know it well. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. See, in life, we naturally expect to get rewarded for our hard work. If we do well at school or university, we expect to be rightfully rewarded with certificates to testify to the results of our labours. And if we work hard in employment, we expect to be rightfully remunerated for our efforts. And that's life. So it is never easy to fully take on board that God's grace of salvation is a free gift. If we secretly think we must have impressed God by doing enough good things to receive salvation, then we have not understood what his grace is. The Apostle Paul felt led to write and confirm this truth to the church in Rome. Indeed, he mentioned the word grace uh, four times in two short sentences to emphasise this truth. Romans chapter 11, this is verses 5 and 6. He said, So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were based on works, then grace would no longer be grace. Many of the world's most undeserving people, including myself, have been beneficiaries of God's grace. Uh, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, was a man who hunted out Christians and helped to kill them. And then on the road to Damascus, God's grace appeared to him and, well, the rest is history. Paul wrote to uh, Timothy testifying this, um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He went on to say, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Uh, John Newton's life as a slave trader made him one of the most callous men of his age, capturing and transporting men, women and children in one part of the world and selling them in another part of the world could not be done with a man with a soft and sensitive heart. And yet, and yet God's grace opened the eyes of his heart. 
and he wrote the mighty anthem to God's grace that even the whole world knows so well. We all know the words, but they're, they're worth hearing again. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He went on, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my heart's relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils and snares I have already come. Tis grace, tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And as the film Amazing Grace showed, John Newton eventually joined William Wilberforce in the successful fight to abolish slavery, the very trade he was involved in. So, our salvation begins by God's grace, must be lived out day by day by the power of God's grace. You see, there are three salvation tenses in the New Testament. We are saved, we are currently being saved, that's our salvation has been outworked. And then, as scripture confirms, those who endure to the end will be saved. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And again, uh, recorded Matthew chapter 24, verses 12 and 13, And because lawless, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. To be able to do this, we need God's grace every step of the way. Jesus does not drop off halfway through our journey. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Uh, Paul wrote that both his standing in Christ and his service to God was utterly dependent on God's grace. Three times in one sentence, he confirms that from start to finish, he is wholly dependent on God's grace. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all, and yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. But despite being saved, we all carry that sin nature within us and to our disappointment. It so often breaks through into our lives, but we can't ignore it. We have to be honest and, and take ownership of it and, and confess it. First, uh, First John chapter 1, verse 6 through to 2, verse 2, if we claim... Uh, to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness. We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and my brackets. And then the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Uh, Ten verses later, John continues then to confirm this work of grace in the lives of his dear children. He said, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. This is just grace, pure grace, amazing grace. Yet, somewhat confusingly, the, the Apostle John then goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 and 9, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And then verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. So, in chapter 1, John says that as Christians we sin, but God forgives us when we confess our sins. And then in the same letter says to the same readers, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. So what does John mean? Well, it's this. There are what the Bible calls unintentional sins. Or as Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15, we describe them, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. We all know that we struggle at times with our impatience, our lack of generosity, our envy, our selfish, what about me attitudes, our ability to endlessly gossip, our endless wrestling with faithful worries, faithless worries and anxieties, our carnal responses to being rejected or offended or accused or unfairness. And we struggle at times with mood swings or 
temper tantrums and various temptations. And at times we, at times we even struggle with our faithful, faithful day-to-day walk with Jesus. These are not things that we choose to do. Not things we in- intentionally set out to do. Quite the opposite. We dearly want rid of these Christian character spoiling sins. You know, the Apostle Paul, who, as we know, was utterly committed to following Jesus, he understood the same struggles in his own life. I mean, here are extracts from Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. He said, For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he finishes this portion with thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, grace, all grace, amazing grace for the man or woman after God's own heart. However, in our humanity, there is always the temptation to abuse God's grace. I mean, if his amazing grace covers our multitude of unwanted sins, well, hey ho, why don't I also claim it for my uh, much loved sin or sins as well? Why don't I claim Christ's righteousness through grace and also enjoy my carnal walk with my flesh the same as the culture do well Paul attacked this abuse of grace head on again and again saying in no uncertain terms that God's grace is not a license to sin Uh, Romans uh, chapter 6 verse 1 to 2 what shall we say then shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means we are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer And 12 verses later, he re-emphasizes this in in Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. He says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. (laughs) He states clearly that there is, and until we reach heaven, there always will be a war between the spirit and the flesh. And we must determine to count the old man and his flesh-driven carnality is dead and determined to count our new man with born-again spirit alive to Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 13, Paul wrote, Brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if, but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So, There are then clear scriptural boundaries between living life under God's grace and the willful abuse of his grace. And this important truth needs careful unpacking. So let me start way back in the early pages of the Old Testament. Now, it may come as a surprise to many, but all the grace offered to the children of Israel through the endless animal sacrifices were only and purely for their unintentional sins and transgressions. There's not even one sacrifice for intentional sin. Just two examples from the many uh, in Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, Leviticus chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, when anyone sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, if the anointed priest sins bringing guilt on the people, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. Uh, The next chapter, for instance, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 15, when anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, they are to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram from the flock, one without defect and of proper value in silver according to the sanctuary shekel. It is a guilt offering. Uh, These sacrifices of animals without defect were, of course, the prophetic foreshadowing of the final and the finished for all time perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, the Lamb of God. The cities of refuge mentioned in Numbers, Deuteronomy and Joshua gives us a similar prophetic example. 
Uh, the Israelites were, who were raised from birth, knowing what God's laws were, they still found that in life stuff happens, and yet even when that stuff had the misfortune to include the unintentional shedding of blood by manslaughter, there were, in God's grace, cities of refuge provided as safe places from any aggrieved relative who would be the avenger of blood. Avenger of blood. In Joshua chapter 20, verses 2 to 4, we read, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. However, however, when the sinful act was premeditated, willful and a deliberate act of rebellion by one of his chosen people, the outlook was different. Uh, for instance, Numbers chapter 35 verses 20, 21 says, If anyone with malice of forethought shoves another or throws something at them intentionally so that they die, or if out of enmity one person hits another with their fist so that the other dies, that person is to be put to death. That person is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when they meet. So unintentional sin finds grace easily, but intentional sin not so easily. King David was, as we know, a man after God's own heart, but we all know of the time when he abused God's grace by just willfully, deliberately and intentionally deciding to commit adultery with another man's wife. When he was finally confronted by the prophet Nathan and realised the depth of his rebellion and the seriousness of his offence towards God, his heartfelt pleas for mercy are recorded for us in Psalm 51. Here's just two verses, verses 10 and 12. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Well, as we know in mercy, God forgave him. But as we also know the consequences that followed from his act of deliberate sin do not make for easy reading. It makes even considering the indulging of your flesh and premeditated sin something to seriously avoid. Uh, this truth, of course, continues in the New Testament. Jesus confirmed that there is a major difference between those who know God's will but choose not to do it and those who, through a lack of understanding, uh, do not obey. In Luke chapter 12, verses 47, 48, Jesus is recorded as saying, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Then he went on to say this, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. You see, if we call Jesus Lord, but pick and choose what we are willing to obey, well, it makes our declaration of his lordship just a meaningless phrase. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, we read where Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? When Peter encountered Jesus, encountered Jesus after his resurrection, Jesus told him to feed and take care of my sheep and feed my lambs. So why the clear distinction? Well, his lambs represent baby and infant Christians and the broken, vulnerable, weak and spiritually poorly fed believers who find it hard to mature into sheep. Lambs are baby and infant and fragile believers who, who so often still take their moral plumb line from the culture and have not yet learned to distinguish between good and evil. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verses 13 14 says this, anyone who lives in milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, and by con who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. I see lambs still struggle with the very basics of Christian life, but with help they will mature. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1-3, to 
Peter says this, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind, like newborn babies, crave spir pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. You know, I love Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, which shows how Jesus feels about his lambs. It says he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. You see, I mention this so that the kingdom's fragile lambs and infants will in no way feel threatened by this biblical stream of truth. But back to following the abuse of grace stream through the New Testament. When a person knows the love of God, knows why his son went to the cross, and knows why his son's blood was shed, and then treats it as a license to sin, they are an, in a dangerous place before God because they are abusing and insulting his grace. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 30 says this, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifices for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing uh, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? And who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. God uses Isaac's son Esau as an example of someone who treated his inheritance from his father as nothing of great value and was quick to swap it for a temporary and immediate sating of his flesh as hunger. Back to Hebrews again, chapter 12, verses 14 to 17, it says this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or as godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Hmm. See, the Bible gives us the target to aim for. First John chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we are. We know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So that's the model we aim for, though we know it will not happen in its fullness until we see him face to face. Here is scripture's clear warning to us all. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. Paul says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, Paul goes on to say, sexual immorality, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. He goes on to say, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So in that portion of Scripture, uh, the one word that Paul used, which is translated uh, correctly as those who live like this, is the word prasso, which means to do something repeatedly or, or habitu habitually, whereas if he'd used the word poio, it would have meant just a single act or an occasional slip. 
In other words, God's grace does not cover lives willfully lived like that. The I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway attitude to sin. This is just bad fruit. And Jesus confirmed this on earth. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Uh, Jesus confirmed it from heaven as well as recorded on the last page of the Bible. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 21 to 23. It says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates and into the city. But then the verse goes on. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Uh, David Pawson, in his mammoth 1,300-page book called Unlocking the Bible, and speaking of the Levitical sacrifices that I mentioned earlier, wrote the following commentary on them. He said this, They only work for unintentional sins. They do not work for deliberate sins. In other words, nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. We all fall into sin unintentionally. Even though we do not intend to do wrong, we do it. And God has provided for unintentional sin, but there is no offering on the list for deliberate sin. This is an important point which is picked up in the New Testament. The New Testament distinguishes between accidental and deliberate willful sins in Christians. He goes on to say, like the Old Testament, it says that if we deliberately sin after being forgiven, there is no more sacrifice for sin. Deliberate sin in those who have been forgiven is very serious, which is why Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Uh, For accidental sin, there is full provision uh, because he knows that we are weak, knows we fall, knows that we do not always intend to do what we do. This distinction runs right through the New Testament as it does through the Old. All that commentary is from page 139 of his book. You see, I know from every survey that I have seen on the subject that the church is awash with Christians indulging in various forms of immorality, just like the culture all around us. And if we choose to live like this, we deny Jesus Christ as our master, our sovereign and our Lord as one we obey. In other words, a Christian who indulges him or herself as the God, godless culture all around does has become a friend of the world rather than a friend of God. And as James says, friendship with the world is ending with God. That's uh, James 4, verse 4. You know, one of my earliest encounters of the abuse of grace was a married man with children who uh, was regarded as a strong Christian and indeed during worship, um, I saw him once at a when I visited the church, I saw him at the front during worship, waving a Christian banner at the front of the church. And yet I knew that at the end of almost every business day before he went home to his wife and children, he indulged in gross immorality. When I confronted him with the fact that this was a clear and deliberate disobedience to God, his face lit up, his hands went up and he said, thank God for his grace. He truly believed what he was saying. But he was deceived. He was, and I believe still is, making a mockery of God's grace. You see, when you choose to live like this, you do not do so under the covering of God's grace. You do not reap everlasting life. Instead, you just reap corruption and defilement and provide easy opening for unclean spirits, spirits of lust, spirits of rebellion. Galatians chapter 6 verse 78, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Indeed, if not dealt with, God regards those who choose to live like this as worse 
than when they were an unbeliever who did not know the truth. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20, um, it says this. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Anyway, I, I pray I've followed the stream of truth accurately. It should certainly instill in us a healthy and, and proper reverential fear of God that would keep us from, from uh, straying and from falling. A.W. Tozer wrote in his book, The Almighty God, No one can know the true grace of God who has not first known the true fear of God. And he also wrote this, Grace is the mother and nurse of holiness, not the apologist for sin. You see, God's grace draws you to Jesus, helps you to grow in Jesus and stay as close to Jesus as you desire. It is not available to help you live rebelliously, selfishly, carelessly and immorally. If you have wandered away from God's grace and defiled yourself, then be heartened by the story of the prodigal son who, smelling of pigs, chose to return to his father in genuine humility and heartfelt repentance. Luke chapter 15, verse 21. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Uh, the faithful stay-at-home son was upset at his father receiving such a defiled son back again. But his father said, this is verses 31, 32, My son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Others, I know, may do this teaching better, but to ignore it completely could have tragic consequences for many. Let's thrive in the beauty of God's amazing grace and let's do what Paul advised the Philippians to do. Let's work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen and God bless.